So this talk has various names. Uh, the, current, the current version is how we talk about economics and why it matters. Um, I gave the same talk as a Hayek lecture, but Frederick Hayek, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, has done, done many things. But one thing that he did was he was one of the first social scientists to point out that human minds are not simply totally flexible. Um, so this quote from him is relevant for my talk, that man's instincts were not made for the kind of society in which we lived. Our minds evolved in very different sorts of societies. And, and when Hayek wrote that, uh, the, the standard view, the standard, what's called the standard social science view, was the blank slate or the fact that we were born and, and we, were, we could learn anything and anyone can learn anything. More recently, the evolutionary psychologists have pointed out uh, that, in fact, that's not the way our minds work. That's not the way we evolve. And um, there's lots and lots of pre-programmed stuff in our brains. I don't know what you may have learned in, if you've taken psych courses, but more and more psychologists are coming to the belief that, in fact, there is an evolved, evolved set of behaviors. So. Um, the general question I address in this talk is why people don't like markets, why people don't like market economies. And some examples of people who don't are the Pope. The, the current Pope is uh, a very anti-market guy, uh, sort of a socialist guy. Um, in the recent election in the US, neither party, neither candidate was very much pro-market. And of course, if you go back even a, a step farther back, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, who got huge numbers of votes from, not from anyone in this room, I'm sure, but from some of your contemporaries, um, was a totally, totally anti-market guy. Uh, he would have had us be in the position of Venezuela had we, uh, had we elected him. Venezuela, of course, is a nice example of what happens when you do away with markets altogether. You, the next thing you do away with is people. Um, and then there's a book by a man named Brian Kaplan, Myth of the Rational Voter, uh, who, who talks about the fact that voters are not rational, voters don't vote for things that might well be in their own, their own interest. Um, and of course, many people elect governments around the world that are not pro-market. Uh, socialist governments are, are not uncommon. Um, so it's a puzzle to those of us who study economics. One of the, the, the most important facts we learn is that Market economies are the most productive. They create the most human welfare, the most human happiness, and longer lives for, for everyone in the economy. Um, and so it's a puzzle. Why is it that many people freely choose systems that make them worse off? Uh, and and, and that, that, that's a puzzle. I've been, I've been working on that off and on much of my career. Um, and this paper is a further, a further uh, extension of that, that kind of question. Uh, there's four parts to the, to the paper. There's um, 
the fact that people don't intuitively understand economics. Uh, there's the fact that, and, and this is something I, I blame economists for a little bit, that the language economists use when we talk about the competitive economy and talk about pure competition and competition actually serves to subvert people's beliefs in the benefits of markets. Um, and then I talk about some, a, a relatively new concept called pathological altruism. And finally, I talk about the morality of the market. But the most important point is that economics is not intuitive. Uh, what I've called folk economics, People are not born understanding a market economy. Um, and there are several reasons for this, but if we think about it uh, from an evolutionary perspective, our ancestors, the, the way evolutionary psychologists view the mind is a set of modules. And those modules are aimed at solving problems that existed when our, when our minds were evolving, when our ancestors or living. So there's a food module or a hunger module that tells us to get food. There's a mating module or sex module that tells us to find a mate. Um, there are trading modules. Humans apparently have been trading for like quite a long time. And so we're pretty good at trading and, and good at not being swindled. But there's really no market module. There's no, there's no module for understanding that markets are useful things. Because the markets in evolutionary times were, were if, if they existed, they were very, very small, very local, not much going on. Um, there wasn't much to trade because there weren't many goods. And so we really don't have any intuitive understanding of, of markets. Uh, one analogy I use is between speech and reading. So um, everybody learns how to talk, right? A child growing up in almost any environment will learn how to talk. Even children who grew up with nobody, no adults talk to them, evolve their own language. Uh, so everyone learns to speak, but you have to be taught to read. Um, so, read so understanding of a market is more like reading than it is like speech. You can't, people can be taught what the benefits of markets. Everyone in this room presumably has some understanding of the benefits of markets. Um, and, and, you know, economists have, have taught it, but you have to be taught it. People who aren't trained have no reason to understand um, to understand that markets generate, generate welfare. Um, another example I use is, is uh, flat earth, right? People's natural belief is that the earth is flat. And in fact, you can get along quite well and for quite a long time thinking the earth is flat. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a jet pilot, it's important that you know the Earth is not flat. But most of the time, you can function as if the Earth, earth is flat. The same thing with markets. Most of the time, you can function as if the markets don't do very much for you. Uh, so what were some of the characteristics of our ancestral society? Um, society was static. It was, it was when, when an anthropologist talks about rapid technological change, as being going from stuff from one type of stone axe to another over a 5,000 year period. Uh, there was no stone axe one, well, we don't like this one, we'll wait six months for stone axe two to come along, right? Uh, very little technological change, very little division of labor. There was some, it was mostly by gender and by age, so uh, I hate to say this because you don't want to get in trouble, but women actually gathered and men actually hunted, and there, so there was gender division of labor and by age a little bit, um, younger men, younger women did different things than older, older men and women, but very little division of labor, um, partly because societies were so small. So Adam Smith told us that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Think of a market where there's 50 people and, and there's a guy who's a really good stone ax maker he might make stone axes three or four days a year, but that's all the tribe could use. There's no, he would not spend all of his time making stone axes because the market was too small. There wasn't sufficient demand. So there was little division of labor. Um, there was little capital because people moved around. They would go one place and then, uh, and then move to another place when they'd hunted out or farmed out the, 
the first location, people were very mobile, and so there was very little capital because there wasn't much they could take with them, um, which may explain our, our, the, the, the intuitive uh, feeling for the, the Marxist labor theory of value. In, in our ancestral times, there was labor, there wasn't much capital, so people are not used to think of thinking of capital. Groups were very small, and outsiders were dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of conflict. The anthropologists for many years tried to pretend that primitive societies were peaceful and it was only uh, when, when they became capitalists that they became uh, warlike. But in fact, uh, Steven Pinker, for example, and others have shown that in the ancestral society, there was a lot of conflict. Uh, the number of people killed in wars was small because there weren't many people, but as a percentage, a, a, a large percentage of people were actually killed by violence, and so it paid to be very leery of strangers, and people would have very close-knit family or tribal, tribal groups. And finally, as I said, there was some exchange. Uh, people, people did trade with each other, but it was very limited trade, um, and, and there weren't many goods, many goods to trade. Uh, so, so all those things are what, what created our current thinking about the way uh, that economists work. And as I say, the way that we would think about a market if we weren't trained to think about them in other ways. So what are some implications? Well, the most important implication, I think, is zero-sum thinking. Our intuitive way of thinking about things is zero sum, that the world is fixed. Uh, and there's several reasons. First of all, again, we're not used, our, our minds are not adapted to technical change. They're not adapted to investment. Um, but it's also true, as I said, it's something like flat earth theory, that a lot of the world is zero sum as we go through it. If you're a little kid, if your sister gets the cookie, then you don't, right? There's one cookie, and you have to figure out who's going to get it, zero sum. Um, if you get older, you start to compete for jobs, there's one job and two or three people competing, one job, zero sum. Someone gets the job, someone does not get the job. Or at a social level, it's zero sum. If we spend more on one, one item, more on guns, more on defense, we're spending less on other items, the famous guns and butter diagram in economics. Uh, all those things are, are zero sum. Um, Populism is basically a zero-sum way of thinking about politics. The fact that uh, things are fixed and you know, vote, voters who are populist basically are zero-sum thinkers. Um, and, and, and that leads to certain misunderstandings, for example, of international trade, which I'll talk about in a minute. but. Uh, but that, those are the kinds of ways our minds work. If we're not trained, we tend to think zero sum. And um, it's, it's important always to keep in mind that the world is not zero sum, but we have to work at it. It's not a natural, natural way of thinking about things. The Marxist claim for, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs is zero sum, right? That says we get the same output no matter what we do, and so we can divide that output however we want. Output is fixed, we can divide it up however we want to divide it up. Um, so that's another example of zero-sum zero sum thinking. Uh, so you can say that both, both evolution and our day-to-day -day experience are consistent with zero-sum thinking, and, and uh, we have to try to get away from that. So what are some some implications. Well, I compared, I compared zero-sum thinking to flat earth theory. Flat earth theory is not harmful, right? If everyone in this room thinks the earth is flat, you know, it doesn't matter much. None of you would, unless there's a jet pilot here, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't affect anything. It's, you know, we don't, we learn in school the world is not flat, but it wouldn't matter if we thought it was. Unlike economics, where if everyone has, has the wrong idea about economics in the democracy, those wrong ideas get translated into, into elections, and those elections can lead to bad policies because people are, are voting for 
candidates who either themselves think zero sum or pretend to think zero sum, pretend to think the way that voters want. And so we can get bad policies as a result of bad thinking. Brian Kaplan's myth of the rational voter. Voters may not understand the way the world really works and they vote, vote incorrectly. Um, or the, the, the college students who were voting for Bernie Sanders who would have destroyed their future had he been elected, but again, uh, zero sum thinking. It's not obvious to, to people that that would have happened. Um, what are some other implications? Well, incentives don't matter, right? Go back to from each according to his ability in a Marxist world, incentives don't matter. You produce the same amount no matter what. Uh, or if, if you're taxed higher in a zero sum world, you still produce the same amount. Whereas uh, in, a, in the real world, of course, if you change tax rates, you change people's behavior. Incentives do matter. Very, that's, that's what economists study. One of our big things that we study is the role of prices and the role of incentives. But zero-sum thinking tends to ignore the, the incentives. The role of prices, prices serve to allocate a fixed pie, but they don't have any effect on the size of the pie. Again, in the zero-sum world, the same amount of stuff is produced. Uh, it doesn't matter you know, what prices are, the same amount is produced. But in, of course, in the real world, that's not true. But one implication of zero-sum thinking is that prices don't matter. Um, then we get to international trade, uh, and we have the world where if, if there are imports, if, if there are imports of a good in a zero-sum world, that must mean that we're producing less of it domestically, and so in a zero-sum world, imports will lead to a reduction in domestic jobs. Clearly wrong, but clearly a powerful statement, one that won the last, the last election. Um, similar to the immigration, right? Immigrants, we all know, immigrants produce, and so they take jobs, but they also consume, right? Immigrants also consume, so people have to produce things for them to consume, and there's no very small net effect on jobs of immigration, but again, in a zero-sum world, the number of jobs is fixed, so immigrants will lead to reductions in employment. Taxes, when, 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 when the newspapers talk about tax debates, it's, it's all about who would pay their fair share, are the rich paying enough, what percentage are the rich paying, all about the vision of a fixed sum, a zero-sum way of thinking about taxes, when in fact we know that as taxes change, incentives change, people's incentives to work or produce or invest change as taxes change, but again, in the zero-sum world, we don't see that effect. Um, and finally, in the zero-sum world, uh, there are, there are no gains from trade. People just trade and they may gain, or you know, each individual may, may gain, but there's no net increase in, in, uh, in, in welfare as a result of simple trade. So all of those things and many others, I, 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 I've come to believe that most of the erroneous economic policies that we adopt are due to zero-sum thinking, that people don't think about all of the implications uh, Another thing people have been talking a lot about, income inequality. Again, income inequality is only a problem if total income is fixed, and some people get more and others get less. But if we have a productive world, then income inequality is a result of some people being more productive. But a zero-sum way of thinking leads to worrying about, about income inequality. So I, I've come to the conclusion that most erroneous policies are due to zero-sum thinking to people not understanding um, the way that economies really work. The next point I want to discuss is the language of economics, and in particular, the use of competition. Um, economists, we talk about competitive economies. Um, we, we can look at textbooks in economics, and I when I say I, I mean my graduate student, uh, went through a large number of, of, of reading, reading introductory textbooks, and we found out that the word competition is used eight times as often as the word cooperation. Um, but, but if we think about cooperation, cooperation, the, mo the most fundamental unit of an economy is a transaction 
a trade between two people, and a, and a, and a trade is a cooperative act. Uh, so trade is cooperative. Economies are really quite cooperative in many, many respects. Um, Adam Smith, of course, of course, talked about competition, but he also talked about this famous example of the pin factory. The pin factory, if, if you remember it or have seen it, is a masterful discussion of cooperation. Many, many people are cooperating with each other to make this pin. One sharpens it, one cuts the wire, one puts the head on it. All these people are cooperating, but even more, uh, almost all the time, almost everything we do is cooperation. We're all cooperating right now, right? I'm giving a lecture, you're either dozing or listening, uh, but if you're listening, then we are cooperating in an enterprise aimed at getting things from my head into your head. Um, when you go to a store and buy something, there's transactions, there's cooperation, massive cooperation, really, uh, because just, just think about just think about this lecture, all the things involved. There's, there's this, the, the laptops, the computers, which themselves are hugely complicated, results of, of thousands of people or millions of people cooperating. There was building the building. There's my car when I drove here today. All of those things are examples of cooperation, and cooperation is really much more important in an economy than is competition. In fact, Adam Smith, his, his analysis of cooperation was, uh, I'm sorry, of competition was taken from sports. Uh, George Stigler, a famous Nobel Prize winning economist, has an essay on the origins of competition and says the analogy was taken from sports. But sports is a really bad analogy for the economy because sports is zero sum. There's a winner and there's a loser. So sports is zero sum, but the economy is not zero sum. And so using a sports analogy really has, I think, misled, misled people for many years. Um, and, and when you think about cooperation again, what are people co -op I'm sorry, what are people co competing to do? Right now, Walmart and Amazon are competing. You know, there's stories in the paper about their tremendous competition. What are they competing to do? They're competing to sell you stuff or they're competing to cooperate with you. So the competition between firms is actually competition for the right to cooperate. Uh, and, and cooperation is, is very important. Um, competition is important too because competition selects the best cooperators. If Walmart wins or Amazon wins, we will know who was the best party at cooperating, but, and, and competition is very important because competition selects um, the best cooperators, but as I say, competition is not really uh, the big picture. Um, so, so uh, as I said before, the textbooks emphasize competition over cooperation. It's even a little worse than that um, because when textbooks mention cooperation, it's usually cooperation between oligopolists to monopolize the market. So the little bit of emphasis the textbooks give to cooperation often treats it as a bad thing rather than as the heart of, of the market. Uh, but, but Again, competition does happen, competition is useful, but it does have its, its, uh, its downside. Um, so, the, and, and it's really sort of strange that economists talk so much about competition. First of all, we talk about pure competition but if you remember, pure competition is a market where nobody pays any attention to anybody else. Farmer Brown and Farmer Jones don't pay any attention to each other. They're pure competitors, but that means to an economist that they take prices as given, so they ignore other components of the market. So the purely competitive market is, in fact, a market with no competition. So in a sense, it's oddly named if we call it the purely cooperative market we might do better. Um, secondly, competition is a tool, as I said, it's a tool for selecting the best cooperators, 
But what is the, to the extent that we can say an economy has a purpose, what is the purpose of the economy? Well, the purpose is to generate consumer surplus, consumer welfare. Where is that generated? That's generated in transactions, and transactions are cooperative. So really, the, the purpose of an economy is much more to be cooperative than it is to be, to be competitive. Uh, it's also true that among humans, competition is ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere. If we go to a Marxist, the communist economy, there's competition. If we go to a, even a primitive economy with hunters and gatherers, there's competition. So to say, well, we live in a competitive economy doesn't really tell us much about whether it's a market economy or not. All economies, all humans are, in some sense or another, competitive. So to call our, our economy competitive doesn't really tell us much about our economy. And oddly enough, the discipline of marketing economists like me are all snobs, and we don't like to think about marketing. But in fact, the discipline of marketing uh, does a much better job of describing the cooperation that goes on in markets than does economics. Economics puts too much emphasis, on, in my view, on competition and not enough on cooperation. And we'll talk about why that's bad later. Um, so, talk about cooperation now. Uh, as I said, the basic unit is, is, is a transaction which is cooperative. We, co we, we cooperate with many more people. I'll use an example of an economist because this paper was written for an audience of economists. So think about uh, a, a young person who just, to me a young person, to you maybe an old person, but a young person who just got his, P, his or her PhD in economics and is looking for a job. So that person does compete, right? There's a job market, it's, it's a rather, it's not chaotic, it's actually a pretty well organized market, which you'd expect from economists, but there is a big market for, for new economists, and you're competing for your first job with maybe 10, maybe 20 other people who are from comparable schools and comparable fields and so forth. So there is competition there, competition for that job. But as an economist, Almost everything else we do is cooperation of one sort or another. How can you be an economist? Well, you read other economists' research and you extend it or criticize it, but you really would have nothing to do if other economists hadn't done the work first. I'm just starting back to Adam Smith and maybe even sooner, but if Adam Smith hadn't written Wealth of Nations, then many of us would, would not have anything to do. So really, most of the time, we're cooperating with other economists. And in fact, uh, you probably don't know this, many of you, but the, the, the currency in, in economics these days, in all academic disciplines, the currency is the citation. How many times was, was your paper cited? Uh, there's a Google has a special uh, thing, Google, site, Google Scholar where we all look ourselves up periodically <laughs> to see how often someone was citing us. Um, but a citation says that you have successfully cooperated with some other economist. Some other economist has found your work worth using in their work, or in other words, has found your work worth, your, your, your work worth cooperating with. So in a sense, the unit of, of, of analysis is the unit of, of, of uh, cooperation. And if you think about a school deciding who to hire, again, the issue is cooperation. You ask, first of all, will this guy, will this person be a good teacher? And what does a good teacher do? Cooperates with students to get knowledge into their heads. You say, will this person be a good researcher? What does a researcher do? Well, first of all, he, he, he cooperates with editors. Now, he competes with others because space in journals is limited but he cooperates with editors to get them to publish his paper. And then once it's published, he cooperates with others hoping that they will cite his paper so his numbers in Google Scholar will, will increase. So, um, so cooperation, again, there's, there's competition, but most of the time, economists and, and is, is, is cooperating with, <coughs> with many, many other people. And, um, in economics, with, with gains, gains from trade, specialization, division of labor, all those concepts are very, very important, but none of them get emphasized as much by economists as, 
as competition. And I think that's, that's a mistake, and I'll talk about why in a second. Um, markets, markets create uh, huge waves of, co of cooperation. The, the market is the most cooperative thing that has ever existed. There's millions of people all over the world cooperating with each other, producing goods and services, buying them, selling them, trading them. All of that is cooperative behavior, and it's all generated by markets. So when people think about markets as being competitive, they're missing out on that whole range of cooperation. But I want to emphasize that when I, when I talk about cooperation, uh, there's, there's an old caricature of the economic man. Sorry, that's the, what it was, the caricature. The person who only tra considers gains and losses and, and trades. The classic economic man is, of course, Scrooge from Dickens' uh, famous anti-capitalist screed, Christmas Carol. Uh, and Scrooge is viewed as a villain um, and a person who is very, very selfish. Scrooge is a very cooperative person. What did he do for a living? He, he was a money lender. What does it mean to lend money? Well, it means you have capital. Someone else wants to use that capital for productive purposes. You cooperate in writing a contract where you lend that person money. Scrooge was famous for exacting very harsh terms when he lent money. What does that mean? Well, very harsh terms means that he was trying to make sure that he lent the money to the people who could best use it. And England in those days was a, was a capital poor economy. So by lending money he, to, the, to the people who could use it best, he was uh, actually making, making sure that the, the capital he had, the money he had, would be used in the most efficient, most efficient way. So when I talk about cooperation, I don't mean it's sort of a new age thing, you know, I, I'm cooperative, I love everybody. Uh, you can be really selfish and you still make your living by cooperating. Scrooge, by the way, ended up as sort of a loser at the end, but at the beginning he was a very good economic man. Um, also, the, also the guy in uh, Wall Street. Um, so, so uh, What's the problem with emphasizing competition? Well, this goes back to our initial analysis of zero-sum thinking. Competition is, tends to be zero-sum, and so by uh, emphasizing competition, as I said before, the, the analogy was borrowed from sports, by emphasizing competition, economists are pushing people back towards zero-sum thinking. There's winners and there's losers, there's dog eat dog. Uh, competition means that some people have to lose out. And um, the, all those things mean that people who are, who are not intuitively good at economics because they, you know, they, they haven't been trained, people who aren't trained, will tend to view uh, cooperation as bad and therefore tend to, to the extent that we talk about a competitive economy, they will tend to view uh, the market economy as being undesirable. I, I like to tell a story about Walmart. So Walmart moves to town and a bunch of stores go out of business. People, what, what is the story we tell about that? Well, one story is Walmart now competed them and drove all those guys out of business and now they're unemployed and they can't sell. Isn't that a terrible thing? This store had been here since the great grandfather in Walmart out-competed them and drove them out of business. Evil Walmart, uh, and many jurisdictions have tried to outlaw Walmart because of that kind of thinking. What's the other story? Walmart did a better job of cooperating with its customers, right? Walmart provided, did a better job of cooperating by providing goods at better prices than other people did. So it wasn't that they out-competed other people, they out-cooperated them, and lo and behold, that's a very different story than the story that talks about, uh, out, about out, out competing someone. Um, so, so I think if economists were to tell the second kind of story more frequently, it's the same facts. It's not, we're, not, we're not misrepresenting anything, but we're looking at it through the lens of cooperation, and I think uh, we would have much less hostility towards markets if 
people, if people did look at it that way. Go back to, the, to income inequality. Again, why are incomes unequal? One is because some people have outcompeted others and gotten more than their fair share of a zero-sum pie. That's the competitive view. The cooperative view is people that are really rich, Bill Gates or uh, Steve Jobs before he died, or Warren Buffett, have gotten to, or, or, or Mr. Trump as a businessman, have gotten to be rich because they do a very good job of cooperating with consumers. And by doing that, uh, if you believe our theories, if they're paid their marginal product, then they have been very, very productive. They're very productive people, and they haven't taken money from the poor. Rather, they've created wealth, and that's why they're wealthier than, than others. Um, successful firms, again, are successful because they are better at cooperating than, than less successful firms. So, um, so the emphasis on competition, in my view, reinforces zero-sum thinking and reinforces the dislike of, uh, of economics. I want to talk about, about a concept called pathological altruism, which is a concept that was invented recently by, by a psychologist, um, someone who basically tries to help someone else and ends up hurting them or uh, hurts himself. But you can think of, think of uh, trying to, be, to help other people uh, and actually ended up hurting them. So many regulations are exactly of this sort. Um, if we feel if we feel guilty about the poor and, and we try to help them, we haven't made the poor poor. The poor are poor because they have little little productivity, and the way to help them is to try to make them more productive. Um, a perfect example of uh, pathological altruism: we're living through an era now of a major increase in pathological altruism, the $15 minimum wage, which has been adopted in many cities and more are adopting it. The mayor of Baltimore just vetoed it. But what's the effect of a $15 minimum wage? One effect is that prices in that city go up, prices of things produced by low-wage workers, uh, and many of those products are bought by other low-wage workers. So we've increased prices, but more importantly, People don't get jobs. Mainly, uh, young people. You know, many times minimum wage goes to second or third earners. But young people don't get their first job. If they don't get their first job when they're young, that means when they're older, they still haven't had a first job, and they may well be unemployed forever. We get new machines. There's a, the flipper. I just read an article this morning about the flipper, which is a machine that flips burgers. Right? Who doesn't flip burgers if the machine is doing it? the $15 an hour minimum wage worker is not flipping those burgers. Or you go into McDonald's now, or Burger King, there's a kiosk, right? What does that mean? You order by pushing buttons on a kiosk. You don't order by giving the order to a person. Um, or grocery stores, you're now going to automated checkouts. All of those things become more desirable as minimum wages go up, and yet, Minimum wages are supported by people who think they're helping the poor, people who are uh, pathologically altruistic. They think they're doing something benefiting the poor, and actually, actually they aren't. Um, rent control, the same kind of thing. Um, many, many other examples of, of pathological altruism uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Um, minimum wage tariffs said, well, we'll help American workers by putting tariffs on goods. That's pathological altruism because the effect of tariffs is to raise the price of others. Again, zero sum thinking can interact with this because you say, well, the prices won't change in a zero sum world. We'll just switch the production from the US, from foreign countries to the US. But again, pathological altruism. Uh, price controls during a disaster you're all in Florida here. I guess you're not in hurricane country, you're too far inland maybe, but other parts of Florida get hit by hurricanes from time to time. <laughs> what happens? Well, the governments immediately impose price controls. What does that mean? That means that other suppliers don't 
come in to supply and that there's price controls on gasoline. Maybe there are tankers who could, go, who could divert themselves from Alabama or Mississippi and come to Florida, but they won't bother because there are price controls on gasoline. Uh, so again, an example of pathological altruism. Um, well, I, I think I'll, uh, well, uh, yeah, I think I'll skip the last point and, and go on to talk about the morality of the market. Uh, if markets are cooperative, then they're much more, more moral than if, if they're competitive, if they're dog eat dog, if we're all out trying to screw our other firms, then markets might be viewed as being immoral. But, and if, if markets are immoral, then you say, well, markets are immoral and they're bad, but we have to tolerate them because they produce lots of goods and services. But, you know, the, the goods and services are, are the benefit, but that we're doing it through an immoral kind of mechanism. We're, we're competing and getting, getting these goods and services, but in fact, um, markets themselves are, are bad things. But if the market's cooperative, all of that goes away. If the market's cooperative, then we don't need to apologize for it anymore. It's not the market is immoral. The market is, in fact, very moral because it is a massive wave of cooperation. And the fact that it produces goods and services is nice, but it does it in a moral rather than an immoral way. Um, people will succeed in markets. Again, in a zero-sum world, you say, well, they're succeeding because they've taken things away from other people. That's how they got rich. But in the world of cooperation, how did, how did, how did uh, Bill Gates get rich? Well, he got rich by creating windows. What did windows do? Well, it generated just huge amounts of wealth for the whole world, amounts that we can't even conceive. He got really rich by doing it, but he only got a very small fraction of the wealth that he created for the world. By his, by his product, Steve Jobs, the same way, uh, and the Google people the same way. By, getting, by producing something that creates a huge amount of wealth, you may get a small fraction of yourself and become really, really wealthy, but at the same time, you have generated just huge amounts of wealth for others to, to consume. Uh, this is why the metaphor of giving back always bothers me. It says, well, people should give back uh, because they're so rich. Well, that would imply that you've done something bad to get rich. Uh, it's fine if you're, if you're Bill Gates and you want to give away your money, although it seems like he's giving it away, but every year he gets richer, so he's, he's not as good as giving it away as he was at making it. But uh, at any event, if, you, if you're Bill Gates or, or Warren Buffett and you want to give away your money, that's fine. It's your money, you earned it, you produce it. I'm happy to have, happy to have you give it away. But you have no moral obligation to give it away. You produced it, but at the same time, produced huge amounts of other wealth. You don't have to give back. You know, it's not that you've taken something and have to give back. You've done good, and the money you made, you made by doing good. So the giving back metaphor has always struck me as a very bad way of thinking about what rich people are doing. They're giving away their money, and that's fine, but they don't have any obligation to give anything back because they haven't taken anything. So if we, if we think in terms of cooperation, um, then the market becomes a much more moral thing, and we don't need to justify it through, through, through other reasons. The market itself is, is moral. Uh, and that's the end. I have a few papers I've cited that, that went into this, uh, this paper, but, but I... Uh, Yeah, time, time for questions. Um, sure, do you want me to get the microphone? Okay, I'll find it. Okay, questions? I'm leaving this, this slide up here so you can write it down and cite me. <laughs> Yes. Here in the back 
Dr. Rubin, I understood that you might talk to us this evening about the pharmacy. I'm sorry, just, just talk in. No, she's right here. Go ahead. I understand that this evening you might consider talking to us a little bit about the pharmaceutical companies. Sure. <laughs> I didn't know that, but uh, <laughs> what, what, did you want to, what did you want to talk well, about? The fact that I thought you were going to shed some light on why we should not be concerned about what the pharmaceutical companies seem to be doing with the prices that they're charging. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm older than most of you, and so I, I'm, I'm a bit of bigger consumer of pharmaceutical <laughs> products than you are, and uh, I must tell you that I'm in much better shape than I would be without those, without those products. Uh, so, so when you say, what do they charge you? The, the real problem in the pharmaceutical industry frankly, is the over-regulation by the FDA, which makes it very, very expensive to introduce a new drug and reduces competition between drugs. And that would be a place where competition would be good because it would lower prices and there isn't enough of it because the FDA. Now, now uh, President Trump has named uh, Scott Gottlieb, who's a, who's a, who's a pro-market guy as head of the FDA, so I'm hoping that we'll see less restriction, more competition, and more reduction in prices. Um, but I, I don't worry so much about the price of pharmaceuticals. And of course, our whole medical system is screwed up anyway because nobody, nobody pays those prices. Uh, they're all sort of, you know, we get a bill from a doctor and there's like 17 different numbers on there, what the doctor charges, what insurance will pay, what they might not pay, what we have to pay, what we might owe. Um, so the prices are all, Hokey because of, of the huge amount of third party paying in the system. If it wasn't for that, the drug companies wouldn't be able to charge what they, what they charge. But again, the more they can charge, the more they'll invest in research and development, and the more new drugs will, will come on the market. So I don't particularly worry about, about their charging for that, for that reason. Is that what you wanted me to say, or you wanted me to say? <laughs> no, I just, I just was interested. We actually had gotten a little that that was something that you might be discussing. Um, I've written about it. I've written, okay. Actually, I've written more about advertising of pharmaceutical goods than I have about pricing. Um, and I, I, you know, my, main, my main work there has been to show that ad, direct to consumer advertising of pharmaceuticals is, is a very beneficial thing because there's lots of information that gets lost in the system. And if, if, if consumers can learn from ads, then they will, uh, they will bring that information. So, so an example, you see a doctor, he says you've got, well, I'll tell a, a, a personal story, it's pretty nasty, but at one time I had toenail fungus and the doctor said, well, there's really nothing we can do about it. I didn't get it to my wife, but uh, so there's really nothing we can do about it. The only medicine we have for it would probably kill you before it killed the fungus. Right. So I lived with that fungus. Then I saw an ad on TV for new medicine and I went to my doctor and said, Hey, I saw this new thing advertised, and she said, yeah, it'll work, and it's not we call it work. I wouldn't have known, you know, to go, because I'd already learned there wasn't a medicine, a medicine for it if I hadn't seen that, that ad. And if you watch the ads on TV carefully, um, we see, you know, we see them, and, and I, I actually wrote a pretty important paper on this, and my wife says, it's because of you we see all these stupid ads. But um, nonetheless, they all have information in them. They all have some information about a new use or a new type of drug or a better type of drug. And that information is something that would not get into the prescribing process if the consumer were not informed. So uh, that part of the drugs, I, I'm, I'm, you know, the FDA uh, at one time banned, virtually banned advertising on television and uh, they, they stopped doing that. They started allowing it and cited my paper when they did, which I felt good about. Um, which is why she blames me. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, that information is very, very valuable in, uh, in, in, in improving health. I guess the next uh, question is... Anything else I didn't talk about you want to ask me? Paul, over here. <laughs> Paul, hello. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, is it? The mic. Oh, it, there we go. Um, 
Oh, low battery. Oh, oh it just stopped loud. Talk loud. Okay. <laughs> uh, if we have fear of markets and we like policies like tariffs so, or the minimum wage, how do we get rich and uh, how do we expect to get richer? Through markets? So if we don't like them or we don't we don't understand them, how do we get here? Well, it's not a it's not a it's not a perfect misunderstanding. And I say that we we uh, we can learn about markets and politicians. In fact, this is the first election in in my lifetime where we haven't been where, where free trade has not been something that both sides were in favor of. So. Uh, you know, I, I used to think of that as an example of the success of economics. We've convinced people against their own intuition that trade, free trade, free exchange is a good thing, and so people have been willing to vote for it. Um, most of the time, you know, m many times, people are, are convinced about the benefits of markets, it, but it's something that has to be convinced. They're not always convinced, but, you know, at least there's some of Bernie Sanders didn't win, at least. Um, so there's some hope, but it's, 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 a, it's a, continu a continuing struggle in a way. We have to continue to work at it. But, and we would be richer if we had more and better markets. We aren't as rich as we could be because we still screw around with, with too many markets. But to the extent that we have most free markets, that's one reason why, we're, why we are as rich as we are. Oh, yeah. Nick, do you want to jump in? Or? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Nick is over here in the corner. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing the mic's, mic's low the battery. Broken. Yeah. Uh, I, first of all, I really enjoy your talk. Thank you for coming out. Um, if you didn't hear him, he said he enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> here, is this better? <laughs> but, um, so, I, I have a policy question, if you don't mind. Um, so, you're talking about pathological altruism and how things don't always end up as government's intent, so unintended consequences. So I'm actually writing a paper right now to examine the impact of different policies on well-being or different types of policies. Rather. For example, I do, I'm do i using uh, health care policies and uh, economic policies. So things like minimum wage, et cetera. So I was wondering if there have been any examples of regulations of the, uh, of the like that have sort of worked as intended with minimal unintended consequences that have actually done a decent amount of good or if it ju or if just innocent, or if it seems to be a general trend in all sorts of policy. Well, uh, for example, are there, are there, are there any uh, conservatives here? You're going to be mad at me, but overall, the best evidence is that the EPA has done more good than harm. Now, on the other hand, the evidence is also that on the margin, the EPA does more harm than good. So they've extended themselves beyond where they, the optimal point. But nonetheless, property rights and things like air and water were not well defined, and because they weren't well defined, markets did not work. And so the, the overall evidence is that, as a general policy, the EPA has done more harm than good. The, the way to tell is to look and see if there is a genuine market failure. Um, and in, in the case of, of uh, I say, property rights in, in land and water and air, there was a market failure. There were no real owners, and so there was a role for government to step in. Uh, as Coase tells us, you have to realize that when that happens, the government may well go too far, which is the on the margin they've done too much. But you know there are some things where where there, there is a, well, public health is another one. Contagious diseases. Uh, my office is around the corner from the Center for Disease Control, um, and, and and they probably have done good because contagious diseases are a true externality. Uh, if I get vaccinated, you don't get the disease either, and so people may have an incentive not to consume enough vaccination and so you may get so something like the CDC can do some good Center for Disease Center for Disease Control. So if there's a real if there's a real true market failure then there is a possibility of but if you take health care the market failure is primarily the fact that either through tax reductions or through other things the government pays for most health care and that creates the market failure. Uh, 
So, so there, there you don't have a market failure, except that the government has over, over, over the years created its own market failure. Okay. Actually, I guess we'll do, Rachel, you had your hand up. Okay. Fire away. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Well I'll, I'll walk closer. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, would you say that zero-sum thinking doesn't have a place in economics in the market at all, or only in specific cases? There may be some role for it. I say short term, a lot of things are, are zero sum. So if you're saying next year, what should we do with the budget, then you may be close to zero sum. Mm -hmm. But you should also consider if you do this with the budget, there'll be more growth if you do, the, if you do something else and may retard growth. So you should always consider the non-zero sum effects. But in some cases, there's something is, is really fixed, and so you have to, you have, you have to deal with that. Thank you. Which we do. Is it time for one more, Tony? I would say one more question. Okay, so Tim, do you want to finish this up? What are your thoughts on government intervention and how it relates to the market? As in, some, without government, you wouldn't be able to have massive research and development to create even more wealth. For like, then, how, but, how do you think government ties into a free market? There is an issue there. Um, the, the theory is that. Some innovations, basic innovations, there is no, there's insufficient incentive to create them, and so you may need something like the National Science Foundation or the National Institute of Health to create basic innovations. When it comes to actually marketing them, you want to rely on uh, private firms. But I always say to myself when I when I tell that story, the NSF, the National Science Foundation, is the academics uh, free ride. And so it may be a true story, but it's also a story I have an incentive to believe, and I don't always believe things that I have an incentive to believe, so it's a little iffy. But at least that's the story you can tell, that, that some innovation uh, tru truly, truly, uh, you know, basic, basic science type innovation, it would be hard for a private firm to capture that value, and so therefore you may want to have a government, government subsidy of that. Okay. Uh, I'd just uh, thank Dr. Rubin for a very insightful talk and uh, compliment him on his excellent comparative institutionalism. <laughs> <laughs> very much indeed. Uh, although our series of talks uh, this year is coming to a close, we of course we'll run them again next year, as I always say, you know, the, when the James Bond films end, it always tells you that James Bond is coming back. <laughs> uh, you'll be back in various guises next year, and with the wonderful audience we have, uh, and I must say I've been very proud of our students and the questions they've been asking, uh, and I hope the series will continue to go from the to strength. Thank you again, Dr. Rubin, and excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.